Okay, I think we're probably all here now. Thank you very much. So this session is on um, UK and US finance and funding for growth and exit strategy. So just check you're all in the right room <laughs> before we carry on. Good. So we've got about an hour before tea break. At, um, so we'll, we'll try and stop at 4.15, but if we go over a little bit, we, we, we go over. Um, my name's Esther Carter. I'm from Kings and Smith, which is a top 20 firm of accountants. I'm a partner in our um, media specialist office in the West End. So we work with a lot of media, creative and tech companies. And working with people right from startup right through that growth journey, sort of startup right through to multinational companies. And obviously, along that journey, clients need a whole raft of, of, of services, whether that's compliance or tax or restructuring, corporate finance advice, fundraising, right through to exit. And obviously, we're really well placed to, um, to give that advice. So, what we're going to do today is explore those various stages of growth and looking at the key points along that journey, but focusing obviously on the, so the, the, the fundraising bits, the, um, the tax reliefs and some potential exit strategies as well. Um, so before we start, I thought it might be a good idea just to gauge where the, so the audience is in terms of the different life cycles of their business, just in case you've got absolutely no one here at the startup end of the scale or no one here from the sort of the, the final exit strategy bit. So are you all familiar with Slido? If you just Google Slido, it'll come up. And if you just put in Crate Tech 2018, and then just literally just tap in whether you're in the startup phase, fast growth phase, whether you're established, looking to expand or looking to exit. And then if we've got an absence of any particular category, we won't wax on too much about it. <laughs> You <laughs> Don't you do it, Mike. Actually, I've got to put something in there so I can see it. And the winner is. And the winner is. <laughs> the startup up fifty percent. We've only got uh, eight people done it so far. Everyone had a go. <coughs> Should be really easy, literally, if you just type in Slido into Google or do that All right, so most of you, then um, pretty much half of you in the startup phase and about a quarter in the established phase and the rest in the others. So that's good to know. So we'll make sure that we, we focus um, on the on the startup as well as all the other phases as well. Brilliant. Okay, so we've got a good lineup of um, panellists today. Um, first in the blocks, we'll have um, Nicola, who's a principal in King Smith's corporate finance department. Um, she's got about 20 years' experience advising on a wide range of corporate finance transactions in the media and the crate tech world, as well as fundraising. Um, then we've got Mike Hayes, who's a tax partner at King Smith. He's got a bit of a competition of how many years experience people have got. He's got 27 years experience um, <laughs> of advising businesses and their owners on a huge range of taxation issues, whether that's sort of pre-sale restructuring or looking at capital gains tax planning, looking at tax reliefs for funding or looking at various sort of interesting um, tax strategies for exiting your business. And then last but not least, we've got um, Carzel McKinstry, um, who is a partner at Aprio, which is um, part of our international association. Um, they're based over in Atlanta, so he'll be giving us the sort of the across the pond view of everything. Um, and he specialises in delivering tax consulting services um, related to M&A stuff and has done a lot of significant capital transactions such as restructuring, dispositions and debt workouts. Apologies, Elizabeth had to cancel on us at very short notice. I'm really, really sorry about any of you who are hoping to hear from her, from you and Mr. Jones. She couldn't make it. She sends her apologies. But what we will do is try and um, find a few sort of case studies um, where uh, Nicola, Mike and uh, Cardell have worked on just to sort of bring things to life. Um, obviously, the idea today really is to make this as interactive as possible. You've already sat through loads of presentations this morning. There'll be a few to come. So we're just going to talk for five minutes and then leave us plenty of time for questions. So please do ask lots and lots of questions. It'll make the session much more interesting if you do, and you'll get out of it what you want to hear. Um, if not, I've got a few questions up my sleeve, but I'm hoping I won't have to use them. So um, I will hand over to you, Nicola. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks very much, Esther. 
Um, thanks everyone very much for coming this afternoon. Um, as Esther says, we're, we're not going to take up too much time as individuals on the panel here because we want to leave as much time as possible for uh, questions. But what we have done is put together a slide that um, represents, if you like, the business journey. Um, it's not the same journey for everyone, but we do tend to find that people uh, categorise themselves in these uh, various stages of their business. And I think um, when it comes to thinking about raising money for businesses, um, it's very important to note that not all forms of finance are appropriate for all forms of businesses. Um, the forms of finance that are appropriate to you tend to follow where you are at and what stage you are at in your business. Um, and so I wanted to run through you know, what are the sources of funds for people um, depending on where they are at, um, what are investors looking for, um, business angels, crowdfunders, private equity houses, banks, they're all looking for very different things. Um, and you may be looking for very different things in the form of an investor that you're looking to attract. So I think it's important just to really set the um, scene by describing uh, what types of funding are appropriate for businesses at what stage in their journey and what those sorts of investors are looking for at that point. Um, so to start with startup, which is apparently where the vast majority of you sit, um, if you are running a, a startup um, in the create tech sector, you must be very familiar with the concept of bootstrapping. And that is because, in the UK at least, it is very, very hard to raise money for a concept or for an idea, um, unless you are phenomenally well connected, uh, unless you raised money for, um, made money for investors in a previous incarnation, or perhaps if you happen to be fortunate enough to be attached to one of the university incubators. Um, but if you don't fall into those categories, frankly, the likelihood is you are bootstrapping your business. Um, it is reliant upon the founder, um, funding it from their own personal resources with calls on friends and family to the extent that they have um, such individuals there to support them. And that's pretty much the norm um, in the startup phase. Um, but there are other angles um, to go for. There are these wonderful creatures called um, business angels, high net worth individuals in the UK. There's about 18,000 of them um, by last count. Um, and collectively they invest circa a billion pounds in UK businesses annually. So they are a rich pool to tap into, albeit you have to know where to go to, to find them. Um, a lot of them are um, entrepreneurs who've previously sold out of successful businesses themselves. Um, quite a few in the technology space, so the create tech sector and looking to back ventures in that sector, um, are, yeah, it's very interesting to them. Uh, in terms of what they're looking to invest, typically um, a minimum of £50,000 per individual transaction. Um, but a lot of people have an appetite for much larger investments. Um, and they are looking for very high returns on their investment. Um, uh, business, uh, angel investing is seen as quite risky. Um, if you back 10 companies, eight might fail. Um, so you're looking to really back some, some um, spectacular growth stories um, with the ones that succeed. You're looking for 10 times your money plus uh, back at the end of the day. Um, and so uh, yeah, a portion of that return may well come from the tax breaks that are available here in the UK and Mike will be talking about those uh, in a minute. So in terms of what they're looking for, it's, it's growth, it's the potential to um, invest in a company that will go through to achieve um, institutional finance raises because that's the point at which they'll exit and it's something that qualifies for the tax reliefs here in the UK. Um, also uh, looking to back startups and um, businesses that are sort of at that um, earlier stage of the spectrum. Um, clearly the last few years the crowdfunding platforms have really um, emerged on the scene here in the UK and there's a variety of models um, that those adopt uh, but I think in the create tech sector uh, really rewards based, does work for some people, it helps you establish if there's a market for what you're offering um, and it can put you in touch with early adopters um, and connect with those sort of people quite early on. Um, but the, probably the more interesting one is the equity-based crowdfunding platforms, Crowdcube, Cedars, the likes of those. And what they do is help um, companies uh, gain access to the mass market of uh, uh, private investors in a sort of coordinated and managed process, which would be practically impossible for a company to do on a standalone basis. Um, so th those are options that are available to you. Um, but uh, once you get through that phase, if you like, once you've started to um, do more than prove your concept, you've started to attract an audience, attract a, a customer base, then it's really the institutional sources of finance that start to open themselves up to you. 
Um, and the first of those I would say um, is venture capital, pure venture capital, which contrary to common belief, it is alive and well um, in the UK. It's not as developed as it is uh, in the US, um, but there are pure venture funds out there. And by that I mean they are looking to back um, companies that have got a certain amount of traction, but they don't have to be profitable. Um, they need to have a gone beyond proof of concept. They need to have uh, actually got a customer base. Somebody is paying them for their product or for their service, um, and it's not just one customer either. Um, but they may well not be profitable. They've got a, um, but the company has got a, a planned path to profitability. And if that's the case, yeah, venture capital is there for you. Um, we tend to say to people who come to us that you need to be looking at a minimum run rate of about a million pounds um, of sales. Um, so you don't have to have completed your last financial year with a million quid, but you need to be showing that you are running at that sort of rate in your, in your monthly figures, and then you are investable, for sure. Um, the checks here in the UK are not as big as the size of the ones in the US, I imagine, um, but there are still a number of funds out there, and you know, we can help point you in their direction. Uh, then moving through the corporate life cycle, if you've um, actually uh, got to the position where you are deemed to be an established company, um, you're no longer on that massive growth track, you've bedded down, you've got a nice ongoing business, then I think, to be honest, the, the main source of uh, finance that people would go to at that stage is, is debt. It's cheaper than equity. Um, it uh, is, is there to help you uh, finance your existing organic growth, uh, possibly the odd um, bolt-on acquisition that isn't transformational, um, provide you with additional working capital. And really the key things that lenders are looking for, if you're at that phase in your development, are um, security and visibility of earnings. And I think the only thing that's relevant to this sector perhaps is that we find that when we're going to banks and they want security, clearly a lot of companies that we work with don't have a whole heap of assets um, for banks to attach to. Mm -hmm. So the issue of um, personal guarantees tends to come up on quite a regular basis. But that, other than that, debt's, debt's relatively uncomplicated um, and can be a, an attractive um, form of funding for your you know, established business that isn't looking to um, expand massively. Um, but by the same token, you might be an established business that's, that achieved very well, um, that, that has achieved great things in its market, but now has a view to, I don't know, go overseas, um, expand into other markets, expand into other product areas, other service offerings, possibly buy a competitor. And that sort of transformational um, uh, viewpoint, that's when private equity tends to come into play. Um, and private equity investors, what they're looking for, well, basically, they, they're, they're on a mission. Um, they want to write big checks um, and get three times their money back inside three to five years. Um, so they are all about the growth, helping you to grow, helping you to professionalise, helping to introduce you to new contacts, new networks. But ultimately, they're just looking at um, where's their exit coming from. Um, so if you're going to private equity, uh, you obviously have to have a plan. What do you want the funds for? Um, how are you going to deliver that growth? But also you've got to really have a view to your exit. Are you going to be selling out to a trade acquirer? Is your exit going to come from your secondary management team? Uh, do you want to, or do you have appetite to um, possibly stay in for longer than your e equity partner? So would you be have up for a secondary buyout, for example? Or indeed an IPO. A lot of people in this sector think, um, oh, I hear it all the time, is you know, exit via IPO. IPO is not an exit on the whole. It's about... Um, possibly getting a, a certain amount of realisation of your investment, but essentially it's just the next step onto the next part of your journey. Um, I think that's probably all I wanted to rattle through um, in terms of just a general overview of, of horses for courses, really, is what we could call this slide. Um, but, yeah, happy to answer questions on any aspects of that at, at, at the end. OK, uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to start off talking about taxation policies, which is rather grim topic, oh. but there you go. I mean, I think it's fair to say that policy of government, and by government I don't just mean the current one, I'm going back to the Blair Brown area, has been to actually introduce tax incentives to really help fill the gaps where small startups and growing businesses are actually struggling to raise capital. So the things that I've got in bold along the bottom there are, are, are some of those things, not all of them. And they don't necessarily have to um, uh, occur in that particular order, but this, that's the way I actually put them down. So if you're a startup business and you're looking for some, some capital to get going, um, it, uh, 
Nicola talked about sort of business angels. Well, if, if you've got business angels investment, they're likely to investing, they're likely to want to invest under the seed enterprise investment scheme. And under SEIS, they can get 50% tax relief, income tax relief on the amount they invest. And if they keep their investment for more than three years and they sell it, they can actually have a tax-free capital gain, which, you know, if your business is really successful is where the real tax benefit comes. A company can raise £150,000 under that scheme. It's got to be a small company, less than two years old, less than 25 employees. So it is really for the very small startup schemes. If you need more money than £150,000, um, there's the Enterprise Investment Scheme, which has been with us for much longer. That's targeted at, at larger companies, companies with up to 250 employees. A company can raise £5 million in any 12-month period under that scheme. It's slightly less generous in terms of tax relief for the investor. They only get 30% income tax relief, but they, they get the same exemption if they sell out and, 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 and make a, a large capital gain after they've owned the shares for three years. These reliefs are very complicated, um, lots of conditions because people are worried about tax avoidance probably cr quite rightly. You can raise money under SCIS and DIS together. So if you're starting up and you need more than 150, you can raise under both schemes at the same time. So let's say you want 300,000 pounds, you can raise under C SCIS and EIS at the same time. You just have to be very careful because the SCIS shares have to be issued before the EIS shares. Um, so there's some complications there, but they are very attractive ways of actually trying to draw money from wealthy people into your company. If, you, if you're in a tech business, a, a creative business, it is very likely you're doing R&D uh, of some sort, and probably it's, it's uh, eligible for R&D tax credits. Uh, for small and medium-sized enterprises, if you're doing qualifying R&D, you can increase your deductible amount in your profit and loss account by 130%. Uh, so if you spend £100,000 on R&D, you can actually get a tax deduction for £230,000. The key thing about this is if you're in a startup situation and maybe you're not making a profit, um, you can surrender the £130,000 if that creates a loss and, and get a repayable tax credit of 14.5%. So in, for many businesses, being able to claim R&D and actually surrender the credit where, you're not made a, where you've not made a profit and get a, a, a repayment of tax from the revenue does actually help with cash flow. And obviously cash flow can be very crucial in, in the early stages of the business. At some point during the, the course of your business, if you're, if you're looking to sort of um, grow it, you're going to need to attract and retain talent. And certainly when you come to a sale, uh, a buyer is going to expect you to have locked in key people, perhaps the next year of management to take over from you when you've walked off with your millions into the sunset, hopefully. Um, so share incentives are really key. I think there are some good um, government approved tax incentives, which give very generous tax breaks and can keep you within capital gains tax. Um, tax in share incentives, I think, are things that you should consider at a fairly early stage. They shouldn't be considered at a point where you've had a, an offer letter to buy your company because it makes the valuation issues quite, quite difficult. But in terms of share incentives, some of our tax approved schemes are, are, are the most generous you can find anywhere else in the world. In fact, all these reliefs are very, very generous compared to lots and lots of other countries. And then when you come to an exit, if you're the founder of the company, um, you know, you'll be looking to sell out and hopefully getting entrepreneur's relief, which means you pay capital gains tax at 7%. If you invested under one of these two schemes, SEIS and EIS, you pro probably got an exempt capital gain, which is even better. You can't get better than exempt. Um, if you've invested on a, 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 a share and centre scheme like EMI, it is probable the employees are going to walk away with a 10% um, tax liability as well. And just one final point. Um, Although I mentioned EIS is really for business angels, if, if you're in a group of individuals that are going to form a company, um, one of the conditions of EIS is you can't have more than 30% of the shares. So if you're a sole founder, it really stops you. But if, you, you know, if there's a gang of you, three or four of you getting together, and none of you can own more than 30%, uh, there is no reason why that, um, that you cannot start up your company with EIS monies. And we've had clients that do that. Um, and of course, the big advantage is when it does come to the payday, hopefully, um, you'll have no capital gains tax to pay at all. And no immediate income tax. And, 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 and well. some upfront income tax relief as well, which, mm -hmm. are, which 
which helps. So that's all I was going to say. So hand over to Cardell. Um. Okay. Well, I definitely appreciate that, Mike. Uh, I just wanted to kind of talk about some of the differences that you see kind of in the U.S. market. Uh, you know, in order to kind of talk about that, right now we are we have unprecedented high financial markets from the U.S. side. So we have that on top of the fact that we have a significant amount of dry powder. Dry powder meaning the amount of money private equity needs to spend. And so essentially the venture capital market right now is hot. It's very hot, completely hot. Uh, and so what we tend to see a lot of times is a lot of our clients getting, you know, developing a technology, really coming up, conceptualizing an idea. And the big thing that, you know, we assist our, our, our startups with is you have to talk about going from concept to commercialization. That, that's what they're really investing in. From a US perspective, there are no assets, there are no claims, and so really we're investing in this IP that you're bringing to us. And so you've got to show us how this IP is basically gonna drive and lead to you know, what, 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 what every investor in the US in this sector loves, monthly recurring revenue, or, <laughs> or a, a way to supplement what, what they're doing right now. And so in terms of venture capital, uh, from a U.S. perspective, you know, I, I serve with kind of both sides. I, I deal with a private equity fund, which is basically created, very large private equity fund, they've created a venture capital fund. That venture capital fund basically acquires software companies, all free revenue, some free clients, some that just, just not very mature at all. And so the way that they're structuring theirs is, they, let's just say you're a software company, you know, you're a software company, you need $10 million to, to go from concept to commercialization. And so what they tend to do is give you two million. See, see what you do with two, okay? If you haven't made any progress, they kiss you and they walk away. <laughs> if you have made progress, what they do is they give you another two. And so that's the kind of, that's the kind of thing that we, you know, we tend to see a lot. It's, you know, if you're gonna woo any type of venture capital fund, what tends to happen is you have to establish this relationship and you know, our vernacular is treat your girlfriend really well, okay? All right, continue to make progress and then you'll see that continuous growth and, and, and other funds kind of coming to you. And most, most of the companies that we see, uh, they're, they're usually going through three or four stages of venture capital, okay? Mm -hmm. The first stage, of course, highest return, they took the biggest risk. Second stage, not so, not so much third stage, fourth stage, okay? And from a U.S. perspective, uh, most of the venture capital comes in as debt, and some people think that this is mean, but it's just the way it works. So you go, well, <laughs> if I don't have any customers, if I don't have any clients, how, how am I paying you the debt? And you're not, you're not. You, 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 pay, you pay what is called PIC, so that's payment in kind. So the debt is just becoming more debt. That interest becomes more of the balance. And so the way that most venture, the reason that most venture capitals, they, they fund it that way, most people are like, oh, that's ugly. No, no, <laughs> the reason they're funding it that way is in the US you get a big benefit if you write off debt than if you write off equity, okay? Big difference, big difference. If you, if you lose capital, that's called a capital loss. You can only offset that against a capital gain. Not, don't wanna jump too much into that. But if you write off debt, debt is an ordinary deduction. And so that's a better tax benefit. And so from the venture capital side, uh, from the US side, you know, we're seeing a lot of activity there. The crowdfunding, uh, you know, I could briefly talk about that. Most of our clients, they, they think it's a better idea because you aren't dealing with this venture capital and you don't have to make the terms so sweet. The problem is you're dealing with a lot of individuals. And so that in itself has issues and problems. Uh, because a lot of our, our, our clients are, they're flow through entities. And so you issue these K-1s that are gonna end up on these individuals' tax returns. And everybody's calling you saying, where's my K-1? I need to file my individual tax return. And so that gets a little bit cumbersome, okay? Uh, and so that, that's, that's a little bit difficult. Uh, but that's what we tend to see kind of on the U.S. side. I'll also kind of talk about the, the, the R&D tax credits and various tax credits that we offer from, from the U.S. perspective as well. The R&D credit, uh, this is the way we explain it to clients. For every million dollars that you spend on R&D, you're gonna get about a 7% of that in terms of an R&D tax credit. That's on the federal side. On the state side, you can receive, you know, 
federal side, you're not going to receive that until you turn profitable. States, the states allow you to do things like claim that credit in terms of offsetting it against payroll taxes and various other things. And if you're doing certain activities, I'm a, I'm a resident of the state of Georgia. Georgia allows what is called a film tax credit. And let's just say you make a film. Uh, Hunger Games, great example. Hunger, Hunger Games was filmed in Georgia. You, you, you're spending millions of dollars in Georgia, okay? You get to uh, essentially take that, take that credit and to the extent that you're not taxable, you can sell that credit. Okay, so you can sell it to people who do pay, you know, who do pay taxes. And what we'll see a lot of times is people are getting 90 cents on the dollar. And so all of this is just to bring money back into your organization, you know, provide tax benefits from that perspective. <coughs> and that's kind of, you know, the evolution of what we see. So it's not no different than the UK side. You start off, you're writing your own checks, you're going to beg cousins and grandma and dad, and then you kind of made a little bit away you start flirting with these venture capitalists and you know private equity like i said to me private equity is getting a lot more into it uh because everybody's willing the, the upside of the returns and also you know you're captive in the sense that you kind of need that money to, to continue continue to go forward and then you kind of get to uh the more established now established is i think established is a re relative term uh establishment means different things for different people uh, some, some companies, they, they're established because they're, they have customers, but most times they aren't generating a, a lot of cash flow. Uh, and so, you know, you've commercialized it, you've penetrated it, you, you've made, you know, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of leeway. And now you are viable. Okay. So let's talk about an, an example. Here's a great example. Just a transaction. I, I, I was just working on this company called Park Mobile. At the end of the day, Park Mobile has an app. You pay for parking based on this app. Okay, very simple idea. I thought, oh, that's, that's a simple idea. Here comes BMW. BMW is like, that is a great idea. Okay, BMW buys into Park Mobile. That evaluation I could not understand. <laughs> <laughs> I go into the Park Mobile offices, all the management is smiling at me. I'm like, what's going on, guys? They're like, the Germans are coming. <laughs> <laughs> So, I, I was astonished, amazed, and asked people for money, and then we got down to the business of talking about what it's going to be like for, you know, to be owned by BMW. And at the end of the day, I think this is a great example. BMW really didn't want to be in the park mobile business at the end of the day. They simply want to incorporate this product into their, into their, into their um, console, it'd be standard. And then they're just going to sell it to competitors. And so BMW is like, great, this is a way for us to make money from Ford, from Jaguar, from Chrysler. Look at you idiots. <laughs> and the whole point is, it's the technology. They wanted the technology. They saw how they could incorporate it. There were some issues around IP, who owned it, so forth and so on. They got through all of that. And at the end of the day, everybody smiled. Okay? So that, that's an example of, oh, Park Mobile made not a lot of money. I think I think I think the management team and the funny guy, the funny part is I, I know one of the, the managers he's like oh you know as these companies kind of come along they're giving management equity and you know they're like oh this paper is worthless you know these guys are never gonna cash out but you know I think overall I think they lost something like 28 million dollars okay they lost 28 million dollars the valuation was in excess far in excess of 80 million at the end of the day. It's because what BMW, the way BMW is pricing them is not based on the value of the software, it's based on how they're going to utilize that. And so that's to me how you, and, and the great part about BMW, of course, is stock market's high. You know, we've got high valuations. And so we, we can, you know, basically give you guys stock, not really costing us much cash, turn around, the synergy's there. We are going to be charging competitors, and, and really, Park Mobile is. It, it also provides what to BMW. Let's let's talk about what Park Mobile is providing to BMW. What is Park Mobile providing to BMW? Te technology and quick, uh, quick to market. Technology, quick to market. What, what's another thing? And the reason I'm mentioning this is only because of the conference, London Tech Week. What is Park Mobile really providing to BMW? 
when I said that, I was like, oh, you guys, man, you guys are really thinking about this. You know, they're providing, they're providing data about where all, all of their customers are all of the time, okay? Now I'm like, oh, they can, they can do that, they can do that. I'm like, now actually, actually, what, we, what we're gonna do is we're gonna package that data and then we're gonna sell it, okay? We're gonna package it and sell it to Starbucks. So Starbucks can issue a coupon to Carlyle that says, you know what, while you're downtown, you know it's a Starbucks, like, right there. <laughs> you might as well walk in. Afternoon, get you a nice cold, save a dollar. Come on. I wasn't thinking about Starbucks. <laughs> and so that's the point. That's the point. And so technology like that, because I never thought Park Mobile would be acquired by this type of company. And so I, I mentioned all that to say you, the, 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 the technology in the direction that they were headed as a management team, that, that's not where they were headed when they created Park Mobile. They were like, oh, well, you just don't have to stand in line. That's what they were thinking of. You simply don't have to stand in line to pay a meter. And you just press accept because you drunk a little more wine at dinner than you wanted to and you need to sit there and drink some coffee, okay? And so you'll see those type of, uh, you'll see that, that type of, that's the type of story and a lot of times that, you know, we kind of come across them. I'm, I'm currently in the process of, I deal a lot, our, our tech, I'm sorry, but I, I deal a lot in technology and technology, a lot of software companies. And so, you know, the, the FinTech is, is, is a great example, okay? So FinTech now, it's all boutique, it was fun, you know. But at, at the time, like five years ago, FinTech wasn't so, people go, oh, no, you're gonna make the consumers pay to pay their bills? That doesn't make any sense. You're gonna make the customer pay to pay you. You're paying to pay. Everybody's like, no, that's, that doesn't happen. Guess what we do in the US, we pay to pay. I can get a power bill, it's like 52 bucks. I go on to pay the power bill, they go like, Cardell, we need an extra 250. Why? For you to pay us. Really? Because I'm lazy, I won't write a check. So I end up paying the 250. And so in America, that is huge. And so now you got all these FinTech companies. And basically, they're, the consumers are paying to pay. And so I say that to say, you know, the, the venture capital that I see, because I had a conversation with a venture capitalist about five years about FinTech. I'm like, oh, this is such a racket. It's such a racket, nobody's gonna do this. I can't tell you the, the, the exits that I worked on on FinTechs have been, you know, financial, like First Data, one of our clients was acquired by First, First Data. One of our clients was acquired by Vantive. Like the valuations are crazy, but FinTech is kind of where it is. And so I feel like on the other side, you know, the VR, I hear a lot about VR and, you know, the, practical applications of that and, and things of that nature. And so I see a lot of that. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. But at the end of the day, there's money there. As long as you have the concept and you have a idea to take it from concept to commercialization, there's funding that's available. You just have to be savvy enough to sell your story. And your story isn't, oh, make a lot of money because you, you're actually losing money. So, uh, and then in the US, just kind of moving on, there are ways for you to Go to private equity. The great part, I always hear people say, why would you go to private equity? And there's, here's what private equity does. A private equity partner should be able to get you a valuation <coughs> that you never envision for your company. They are, they, are, they, are, they are the absolute masters of that, of creating a market, creating a competing market for a company. I think that, that's probably what they do best. And they also tend to uh, formalize companies, you know, bring in very really good management teams, they, they, they kind of, you know, and once you're established, to me, they do a, a really good job of, of that. Uh, and then, you know, as, as you're kind of transitioning to, uh, because what, what tends to happen is the entrepreneur's relief. I think that's, a, and we'll just hear, we have entrepreneurs and all of their wealth is tied up in one business. Everybody knows that's bad, okay? So everybody's looking to take a little bit of money off the table, either sell out or, you know, yeah. Or, or just to, to take a little bit of cash off the table. So from a U.S. perspective, there are opportunities for there to, to do that. Uh, we have special rules like Mike, Mike mentioned here in the, U, you know, in the U.S. as well, where particularly you can sell to an ESOP. You can sell under you know, certain types of stock. It's called 1202 stock. It's a code section where 50% of the gain from a stock is not taxed. And so there, there, are, there are special provisions from a tax perspective that you can, you know, where you don't have to pay tax. Even with this new tax law, 
that came into being in 2018, there's this new provision where you can uh, basically roll over some of your gain without paying tax. And uh, it's, it, I, I just think it's gonna, it's gonna take off. It's called the Opportunity Tax Credit. But, uh, but just wanted to throw some of those and compare and contrast. It's just that from, from, a, from our perspective, literally, and I was sending out emails, Mike's like, what are you doing? I'm sending out emails, everybody's bothering me. Like, you know, the activity in the financing is, is really hot right now. Super, thank you very, very much. So we've got about 15, 20 minutes left. So over to you, really. Um, questions from the audience, yes. Um, US investors investing in UK companies, do you prefer that we um, sell for Delaware do you ask for a flip? Um, what's the sort of appetite on UK companies that are growth stage um, making the first step into the US? So do you invest in um, UK companies? Do you need to be a Delaware? And if so, does it have to be a flip? Uh, I think what, I, what I've seen, uh, and, and I'll, 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 most, most of our companies like to invest in US-based companies yeah. at, at the end of the day. Uh, it's, it's easier to make disclosures to your investors that way uh, it, it, I feel like they're, you know, the attorneys dra drafting up the agreements are much more comfortable under U.S. jurisdiction, and so if we're a U.S. investor, we typically have that Delaware entity, even though it might be investing in a, in a U.K.-based company. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, we talked about this, that there are issues around if you've already set up and developed everything here in the U.K. and then think, oh, but the big pools of capital, they're in the U.S., so I'm going to go there and look. It's kind of, there's a mismatch then between where your IP is sitting where your business interests are really sitting um, and, and the investors that you're looking to target. Now, there are US investors who clearly see opportunities in the UK and Europe and have come over here, so you can target the UK arms of those. Um, but if you really want to get into US venture land, I think you have to go to the States and probably start there. Um, and you ask for a flip? Like, does the UK entity have to flip to? It's not even that simple because um, it depends where, yeah, where the where the IP is, whether it can actually flip like that. It, 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 it's almost work out what you want to do and almost start there um, is, is the preferred option. But that's like, I appreciate it. If you're already in that phase, then you need to start looking at it slightly differently. You can, I mean, you can flip the company into a, a Delaware company, for example, fairly easily on a mm. tax-free basis. And Delaware, I mean, there's no particular tax benefits of being in Delaware. You, you're going to be taxed in the States wherever your company's operating. Um, it's then, I think, that what comes next is what do you do with the IP? If the IP is yeah. in the UK, is the investor comfortable with the IP being held by a UK mm -hmm. subsidiary? Now, I think, I think Americans take a pretty positive view about UK, English law and, and the court system over here. Um, that's why so many people come to the UK to get divorced. But, um, <laughs> um, so, uh, so I think, uh, but they, may pr they might prefer the, the IP to be transferred out into the American company, and obviously that involves something that might create a tax bill in the UK yeah. um, if, if the IP's got some value at that point. Okay, yeah. And so essentially what, what PIC is, is usually it's an option. It's an option that the company can either pay the interest or basically that amount gets accrued to the debt. Okay, so $5 million, let's say it's 10%, you know, 500,000 at the end of the year. Either you have the cash to pay us the 500,000 or, or now the debt is 5,500,000, okay? And so uh, depending, on, depending on the cash flow of the business, it just gives the, to, to me, it gives the business flexibility. Uh, it shows a little bit of, uh, you know, it, it shows a little bit of uh, belief in the company because if you have the option, then why wouldn't you just, you know, some people like to get their cash. Uh, but, you know, the, the pick element is usually, you can pick something, you can pick an instrument for about five years before there are really tax consequences associated with it. Uh, but, you know, 
at the end of the day, it just gives them the opportunity to convert at a different at a different you know pace. The 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 whole point again of the debt is a coupon. Everybody wants a coupon, particularly if you're a lender, uh, and so that's that's one of the aspects of that everybody's looking for. And so another another aspect of it is. Uh, as, as I've told, as some of my clients have explained to me, the way that venture capital and private equity gets paid is based on cash flow. And so they also want the ability that if you are cash flowing, you know, hey, you pay that, that cash to us, that way our IRR can look really good yeah. for a particular year, and that's, that's how we get compensated. That's, 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 another, that's another conversation, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how we see it. And that's very much the case, particularly with private equity investments in the UK. They won't necessarily put it all in as, as pure equity. Um, they'll put it in as some sort of instrument, loan notes or convertible instrument, or something that carries a running return so they can start to take some of their cash back um, or return on their investment through the course of the life of the investment. They're not just putting it in on day one and expecting a massive payday three to five years out. Sometimes it's also a feature of making sure they don't swamp management with too much equity. You know, if the valuation is so high and it all goes in, um, you're left with very little. So it's a way of also managing that sort of how much of management got, is there enough skin in the game for them versus the, um, versus the investor as well. Any other questions? Um, this is to do with the sort of media tech landscape. Um, we've been advised in our current sort of growth stage fund um, we're in media tech not to take um, any corporate VC money because essentially taking a corporate VC money in a media tech business from my industry will uh, block a potential exit. Um, just as using hypothetical examples, uh, Virgin Media Ventures investing in us, um, Sky Ventures won't buy us out of Sky. Mm -hmm. What's your view on, um, on any category? You know, the, the company taking corporate VC, which there are big funds around now, uh, Comcast, Ventures, uh, Hearst Media in the States, right? Um, but that potentially, you know, in the same country uh, blocks uh, uh, an exit. Um, what, what's your view on, on that? Um, I would say it, de it definitely narrows your options, yeah, for sure. Um, does it rule them out entirely? No, not in all cases. Uh, depends who is doing the venturing, who's doing the investing. Um, so. The BBC, for example, invests in TV production companies um, and uh, the rights attached to those investment deals tend to mean that when they come to be sold, it's not the BBC that's buying them, um, but that's a special case. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's all down to what rights attach to that investment um, and what uh, percentage the corporate venture is getting. But you know, chances are, yeah, if, if you're getting money from that source, that's your most likely exit in due course. Um, and it would make it difficult to market it more widely, for sure. I suppose right. it depends whether those are kind of a strategic tie-up between the businesses as well, yeah, whether it's purely it, funding it, or whether the businesses are starting to become a bit intertwined <coughs> and cross-refer clients yeah. or work on joint projects and other things. It, I, I think yeah. it's a case-by-case. Case it, it is case-by-case. Case, it? It, it slightly narrows your options. Um, yeah. But sometimes you don't have other options, right? So, um, you know, it, it's the same question about uh, how should you go yeah. about choosing a private equity partner, well, it's nice to have the choice, but if you've got mm. one offer on the table, <laughs> then that, you know, that, that sort of determines how you go about choosing. So, yeah. so essentially, if, if, a, if a company is going to take money from the corporate VC, you're looking for an exit to that? Most likely. Um, I think, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, yeah, the likes of, um, yeah, certainly, the, the, some, some of the well, corporate VCs or incubator funds outside of the academic environment. That, that seems to have been the track record, yeah. yeah. This might be a bit of a contentious question, so sorry about that. <laughs> we, we've heard that the VC landscape in America is doing very well. How, how is the horizon for the UK considering our political turmoil at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, Cardell referred to um, it being very, very hot in the States and there being a lot of dry powder. The same is true in the UK, um, particularly at the, um, within private equity. Mm -hmm. Um, there is, there is a, a, a wall of cash um, still waiting to be deployed um, and that's from people who've had their fundraisings you know, in, in previous months and years who have got cash to, to deploy. Um, and there's a lot of equity money looking for homes um, in, against the backdrop of a low interest um, bearing environment. So, so there's plenty of cash, 
but that tends to be in the UK much more at the private equity end than the venture end. I think the venture market, while well, I said it's, it's alive and well here in the UK, it is, it's not as developed as the US. And certainly you're talking about raising significant venture checks for pre-revenue businesses. We, we, we think we're doing venture if we're doing raising slightly less um, significant amounts of money for pre-profit businesses. That's venture from more of a UK angle. So yeah. what will Brexit do to it? I mean, well. the, in terms of um, some of the restrictions around investing, the thoughts are some of those might be lifted or expanded. So for example, the tax breaks, many of which um, the, head, uh, the upper levels of which are dictated by um, uh, European government. Um, well, there's been a fall off in EIS investment over the last mm. year or so because in 2015 we were required under the EU stage aid rules to apply some restrictions to EIS. And one of those, which we didn't have before, is that the company has to be um, have been trading for seven years or less to qualify for EIS, whereas we didn't have that limit before. So that has actually made it much more difficult for a company that's eight years old, for example, to go and raise money from venture capitalists or, or from private equity or from um, um. Uh, business angels. So it, the, the, the unofficial view for the revenue is that come Brexit, you know, we'll, we'll reverse make it those, those, some of those restrictions and make it, make it easier. But then that depends, I suspect, on whatever agreement we negotiate with the EU and whether they'll try and stop us. Which they seem to be wanting to stop us do anything uh, at the moment. So who knows? But... Um, you know, Brexit could be an opportunity as well as a... Uh, but I'm not putting any money on it. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions from the audience? On corporate, we see, you know, perhaps uh, uh, investing strategically and uh, choosing between uh, growing your strategic investment or growing the valuation of the company. Maybe some good examples of uh, case studies that you have gone through. The BMW case study was really good. They had no intent to grow the company valuation. They just wanted to acquire it. But uh, do normally the VCs have clear strategy on which which path to choose? Or I, I, here's a good example of that. I'm, I'm glad you said that. Uh, sometimes I feel you know the, the difference in what we see now is when you have private equity that has a VC fund, private equity, ha they have operating companies underneath already. So when I think when their VC looks at it, they're like, oh, that could be a good supplemental product to something that we have, or we can put this into a platform company that we already have. And so I think that they see VC a little bit differently because they have a group of buyers already underneath them in terms mm -hmm. of operating entities. And so that I, I do see. The, the, other, the other areas where I see you know, strategies is people just kind of developing a particular technology in, the, in a particular sector. And, and a good strategy there is we deal with a fund, they invest in nothing but technology software that they're going to sell to universities, schools, uh, public schools, private schools, you know, that, that deal with curriculums and various. Now, they know at the end of the day, at the end of the day, some of these are not going to be fruitful at the end of the day, the software that they're developing, and some of it's gonna be outdated and so forth and so on. But the relationships that they have with the procurement directors already at a NYU or at a, a much large, a large university, what, they can, what they've been able to do is kind of replicate that. So we had a software in the medical school, now we have a relationship in the business school, now we have a relationship, and so I say that to say, their strategy is a lot more integrated than they, they, they used to be. They, they don't see these as one-off investments uh. the way I think that a lot of times. And I think that's a very sophisticated investor, but I'm seeing much more sophistication to that level. It's, it's not about, oh, let's see what happens. We'll, we'll just give this company some money. Let's see if they, see if they make it. No, it's more of a, oh, we, oh this, is, this is good. This kind of supplements. Now, if they can figure it out, it'll be really good. If they can't, <sighs> Is, is VC. They, they were one of the eight instead of one of the two. Hmm. Huh. I was interested how much uh, the grant uh, impact on the market or the, what the market's feeling about uh, grants for relocation or grants <coughs> particularly uh, in the seed area uh, in the UK mentioned there's a lot of seed money. I work in that area so I was just wondering how the market's feeling about 
so on the US side? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so so on the US side, and this is um, this is something that I, I kind of mentioned, uh, but if you set up a new company in what is called a opportunity zone area in the US, what you usually have is opportunity zone is usually an economic area where they're just trying to encourage investment. It's, 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 it's rural or it's urban, it's just underperforming in, in one way or another. Uh, and so in those areas, if, if, if you know, money is being directed to those areas for businesses in those areas. Let me say it that way. So it's kind of their form of government grants. That, uh, that's, yeah. my, that's my... Yeah, and we have something very similar. I, I'll confess, I don't deal with that sort of thing an awful lot, but we have um, yeah, regional development funds, uh, right. again, to, trying to target areas of economic deprivation. We also have specialist um, venture capital and private equity investors who, um, like people like Impact Ventures or Bridges, who are um, alongside trying to make a financial return. And that's absolutely their prime objective, but they are looking to back either social ventures or ventures that have um, uh, the opportunity to help um, the community in which they are based alongside making a financial return. Um, so there are some blended models out there. Direct grants, I don't have an awful lot to do with, to be honest. No, the, what I would say about grants is that they can be uh, regarded as state aid uh, and, uh, and so if, they, it, and if they are state aid that that can actually prevent or restrict some of the tax reliefs that I've been talking about so I think before you, you take out a, a grant from a, a you know from the, the mayor of London or from wherever you might take it I think you just have to check through the consequences does it affect any other tax benefits yeah, it's been by yeah that's um, right yeah that. yeah that's right does it remove the relief entirely, or just bre or, or uh, they it breach the it limit? It, it, can, it can stop it for yeah. for, for okay. R and D. It can actually stop it. Okay. There are a huge number of pitfalls for all those credited tax yeah. reliefs. Uh, yeah. Be really careful. Really careful. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. It's called to pass. I think we'll call it a wrap. Obviously, you've got 15 minutes to your next session, so if anyone wants to come up and ask any kind of one-to-one -one questions, feel welcome. We'll hang around for 15 minutes. But other than that, thank you very much. Cheers, thank you.